morning. Welcome to Grace Hill Church. We are glad that you are here. It is the Lord's Day, and we are here to worship him. Um, we are here to worship him because he is God, he is righteous, and he is worthy of worship. No matter what, he is worthy of worship. Um, I want to say we because I don't want to single myself out. So if this doesn't apply to you, humor me. We are a people of very short memories. Lots happened in the last uh, week or even couple weeks. Have you seen any of the news images of what's going on in New Jersey and New York because of the storms? Th that started down in New Orleans. We forget about all the stuff that happened down in New Orleans with that. But we forget that just a couple days before that, there were some tragedies in Afghanistan, and that's still going on. But just a week before that, Haiti was almost completely destroyed. What, what's the next thing? We, we forget what happened before. There's a lot going on that could cause us to be depressed and take our minds off of things and our focus in the wrong place. I ask you to not push that aside and even some of the stuff going on in your own life. Maybe you've had a great week. Maybe you're busy planning for a wedding and you're super excited. Maybe you just buried a close friend this past week or a couple weeks ago. And so you're down. I ask you not to forget about that, but bring that stuff to the Lord with you today. And say, I'm hurting here or I'm rejoicing here. God, work with me through this. Enable me to see your glory and your worth through that. That's why we're here today. So as a call to worship, I remind you uh, uh, that we do an armor verse every month in September. Uh, just started. It's a new month, so we have a new armor verse. Um, and we'll start that. As a, and that's a great call to worship if we've been having a rough week. So let's uh, recite that verse before we go to prayer and we start our singing so um, we'll, we'll recite the reference, the verse, and then the reference again. Help us to get God's word into our head a little bit. If you would recite with me. Isaiah 41, 9b through 10. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Isaiah 41, 9b through 10. That's speaking of Jesus. That's prophetic. But it's also speaking to God's people. He will uphold us because he has the righteous arm, not us. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, some of us with joyous hearts, some of us with heavy hearts, all of us needing you. We thank you that you have chosen us. We thank you that you have not cast us off. You say, fear not. Uh, it's easier read and easier said than done. So help us to remember that you are with us and that it is your strength and your enabling and your righteous arm that carry us through the dark times, but also enable us to rejoice in the good times. So now, Father, as we understand that this is a day that you have made for us to worship you, may we Not forget about outside life, but bring all of that to you and say, God, there's places here we've messed up. There's places here where we've specifically gone against your will. And we bring it to you and we ask you to help us, enable us to live righteous lives for you. Because you are worthy. And because you love us even when we're unlovable. So now as we sing to your great and glorious name, 
may you inhabit the praises of your people. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Would you please stand and join us as we worship this morning?
and you may be seated. That really is what worship is all about. Uh, we turn our eyes to Jesus. We look to him. Our sermon text today will include a phrase that talks about how when we seek the Lord, when we repent of our sin, we put our faith in Jesus, we find abundant pardon. It's a wonderful thing um, to turn our eyes to Jesus and to know that in him we find mercy and grace that gives us life, that gives us hope. So we're glad that you're here. And we want to pray a uh, number of things that we need to be praying for. But before I go there, um, our missionary spotlight this week is uh, the Milwaukee Rescue Mission. So let's be praying for them and the ministry that they have of really making the gospel known, um, but doing that in the context of also meeting um, the needs, physical needs of people um, that that they minister to. So let's pray for them. Also, on the round table in the narthex, you will find a new brochure that is our small groups brochure. And in that brochure, you will find information about what our small groups are, uh, what we want to accomplish, how we want to function. Inside that brochure will be a slip of paper that will tell you of the different groups that are available and how to sign up for a group that you would like to be a part of. So what we want to encourage you to do is to prayerfully consider being a part of a small group. Um, coming together for worship is very, very important. Coming together for Sunday school to learn and be equipped is very important. Uh, being here on Wednesday night, praying for our church family and the community and the world is very important. Small groups is unique in that it gives us an opportunity to get better connected with a smaller group of people and build the kind of relationships where we are free to be transparent and honest, where we can be real with the struggles that we have in life and we can find mercy and grace that will help us. So we are instruments in God's hands to help people to turn their eyes to Jesus just as we just sang and and so the relationships that we have an opportunity to build help us to persevere in the in the faith help us to be transformed and to grow and we would love for all of you to be a part of that and so pick up a brochure on small groups um, as you leave today and over the next couple of weeks we'll give you an opportunity to sign up for a small group now Hopefully, the way that the Spirit leads you to sign up, uh, all of the groups will be evenly dispersed and we won't have to do any rearranging of groups to make everything fit. However, um, what we want to know is your preference for a group and if in fact we get into a situation where the groups are too big or not, um, we, we, the elders would work with you to make sure that you find a group that's going to work for, for you. Um, but we want to know what your preference is, so fill it out, um, and there's instructions on what to do with that. So, so we want to pray for all of those things. We also want to pray for Debbie Meisner. She is in the hospital right now. Uh, she has been in there for two nights now. And um, Lord willing, she can come home today. Uh, she's waiting for uh, some additional results from blood tests to determine whether or not she can come home. Uh, she went in with some abdominal pains. So let's, let's pray for Debbie. Uh, she's had a pretty rough couple of days. So let's, let's pray for her. Um, pray for Becca's nephew. Uh, he is two months old and is in Children's Hospital um, with a pretty serious illness. And um, um, I think doing a bit better, but still has a ways to go. So pray for little Micah, uh, if you would. And uh, so let's, let's pray together. Father, it is 
just utterly amazing. It is a display of your glory, your love, your mercy, and your grace that you provided your very own son to come to this earth and to willingly go to the cross and suffer in our place so that you can offer forgiveness of sin and the gift of righteousness, Christ's righteousness to us, the gift of eternal life. It's your mercy, it's your kindness, and today as we've gathered, we've gathered uh, only because the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from our sin and given us this privilege. It's an undeserved privilege to even come before your throne and you you command us to come even boldly knowing that we'll find mercy from you grace from you so we we're so thankful that you have made a way for us as rebel sinners to be restored and live in your favor and in a relationship with you and we we thank you for that this morning we pray for debbie Lord, you know what she's facing, you know what she needs, and we pray that you would bring healing to her body and just flood her with just the comfort of your presence and the peace of Christ. May they reign in her heart. Uh, we pray for little Micah that you would help him to heal and to regain his strength and we just pray for their family that they would look to you and just rest in your care for their little one. Uh, we thank you for the Milwaukee Rescue Mission and the school that they have, the training that they have, the, um, the, the availability for homeless people to find a place to have a roof over their head, to have nourishment for their physical body, but also to have people come alongside of them and to help them see the glories of Christ. And so we pray for that ministry, pray for the work that they're doing and that you would encourage them and strengthen them and meet their every need. Um, Lord, we're, we're thankful for this body and for each one that's here. Um, needs that have been mentioned, Lord, you, you know what all of us are facing you know what we need. May we be people who trust you completely, even as our, our theme verse for Isaiah and Isaiah 12 just calls us uh, to, to know that, that you are our salvation and we can trust you and not be afraid. Um, so Lord, help us to be a people who are strengthened by your spirit so that we trust you no matter what you bring into our life, and that we would not be overcome by fear. And Father, this morning we're also thankful for the opportunity to give, and we give as an act of worship. Uh, we give to meet the various needs of this ministry here and throughout the world. Uh, we give even according to uh, just the, with the desire to be uh, enable the church to respond to the needs of people and to encourage others to trust you more and more. Uh, Lord, you're, you're a great God. You're worthy of worship, and we want to just continue that time of worship together now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand. Let's sing in Christ alone. He, he's our hope. Let's look to him together.
One of the benefits of being on the, the leadership team here is getting the kind of the advance notice of what the plan is for the Sunday service. Um, and and, and uh, you, you have a chance to, to know what is coming. And Isaiah 55 is just an absolute um, passage that is packed full of truth. And, uh, you know, all of, all of Scripture is, is edifying as God breathed, uh, but some just hit a little different. For, and for me, Isaiah 55 is one of those passages. So um, I, I uh, implore you to read along with me. Isaiah 55, that is on page 615 in the, the Bible in the chair rack. Uh, but we will be reading this whole, this whole chapter. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me here, that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation... You shall call a nation that you do not know, and a, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that, be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. All right, thank you, Andrew. Have you ever been thirsty? I mean, really thirsty. I can remember as a kid helping my Uncle Raymond put hay up in the hay mow. And uh, as a young kid, I can remember hot summer days. I can remember dusty, dirty days, sweaty days. Uh, I can remember those days way up in the peak of a sweltering and stuffy barn, throwing those hay bale, bales around. Um, I, I can remember in that context being extremely thirsty. Um, and I can remember my Aunt Mabel providing ice cold Kool-Aid um, in a one-gallon thermos jug. I can almost picture that jug today. Now, I remember some cookies too, but I remember how satisfying it was to drink that ice-cold Kool-Aid uh, after you've been working so hard. Now, I, I am very fortunate, and we are very fortunate. Um, I, I've never lived in a place where good drinking water wasn't readily available. Um, there are places in the world where that is the case, um, where there, there is a question of whether or not there will be enough good drinking water. Certainly now, in the wake of Ida coming ashore down in Louisiana and other places, uh, a shortage of good drinking water can be a really serious problem. But if you remember your Old Testament history well, you'll know that there have, there have been times in Israel's history where their thirst created a real crisis. 
In Exodus chapter 15, right after the Lord had delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt, they thought they were going to literally die of thirst. God had just miraculously uh, parted the Red Sea, delivered Israel from their enemy, and he, he did that in a dramatic way to display his awesome power. And in Exodus 15, they responded by singing this great hymn of praise because the Lord had triumphed over their enemies in a glorious way. And the text tells us that they immediately set out from the Red Sea towards the Promised Land. And after traveling for three days, they found no water. And when they came to Mara, they did find water, but they couldn't drink it because the water was bitter. It was not good water. And, and so the, the text says that the people grumbled against Moses. And, and in response, Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log or a tree, and he threw that tree into the water, and this bitter water became sweet. Exodus chapter 15, verse 25 through 27 says this, There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. <laughs> Their thirst was satisfied by the Lord. But it wasn't long before they were in trouble again. In Exodus chapter 17, Verse 1 through 7, seven, we read this, All of the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandments of the Lord and camped at Raphadim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So my, Moses cried to the Lord, what, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass alone before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you, and there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And so Moses did, in the sight of the elders of Israel... And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So again, the Lord satisfied their thirst. But was the Lord among them? Well, 1 Corinthians 10.4 says, Yes, he was. Even Christ was among them spiritually. Verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 10 says, For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So the Israelites were not alone in the wilderness. Christ was with them spiritually, meeting their every need. But would they trust him? Well, in Numbers chapter 20, the Israelites were still in the wilderness, and they were, again, thirsty. Um, keep in mind that the Lord had miraculously provided water and food for them again and again already. But 
They are again thirsty, and they went to Moses grumbling and complaining, and I quote, Why have you brought the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, both we and our cattle? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? (laughs) And again, Moses and Aaron went to meet with the Lord in the entrance of the tent of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord spoke to them, and I quote, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, your brother, and tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. So you shall bring water out of the rock for them and give it to the congregation and their cattle. And Moses did this, but this time Moses provoked the Lord's anger when he said this, and I quote, Hear now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? (laughs) And Moses struck the rock, and an abundant supply of water gushed out, but Listen to what the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in response, and I quote, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given to them. These these are the waters of Meribah where the people of Israel quarreled with the Lord and through them he showed himself holy. So Mo- Moses did not set the Lord apart as unique and all-powerful and altogether responsible for satisfying their thirst. Mo- Moses took some of the credit for it himself. Moses stole from God's glory. But, but again, it was the Lord who satisfied their thirst. So with those experiences in mind, with those experiences in their history, we come to Isaiah 55 this morning. And here, the Lord says, come to Jesus, drink, eat, and be satisfied. Listen again to verse 1 and 2. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, And he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. But we have here in this text And Andrew alluded to this already, but we have here in this text such a warm, a gracious, compassionate, love-filled, and generous invitation to to drink and eat what only the Lord can provide and truly be satisfied, truly be satisfied, fully, in every way. This invitation here in Isaiah 55 just draws our hearts into him. When you listen to this invitation, you, you want to come. The invitation here goes out to all people. Everyone who thirsts, come. Come and drink. The invitation is given by the Lord who sees and understands our needs. He he wants to meet our needs. And what He gives is free. It's a gift. In fact, what's offered can't be purchased with money. It can only be paid for and given by the Lord Himself. And, And it's lavish. Certainly, if you're in the desert, water is good. But what He offers isn't just water. It's wine and milk. It's the best. Come and drink and eat and be satisfied with what the Lord provides. And if we're told here in this text, and if what the Lord gives freely, truly satisfies, why spend your money for that which does not satisfy? Why why labor and, and work on your own for 
what does not satisfy when what Jesus offers freely, lavishly, is what really truly satisfies. The, the point that you shouldn't miss is this. What Jesus offers is what truly satisfies. But the question remains, what, what does Jesus offer? Is it physical drink? Is it physical food? Um, and, and let me remind you again, chapters four, 54 and 55 are given to us to know how to respond to chapter 53. Um, what did we learn in chapter 53? It was the Lord's perfect servant suffered in our place so that we could be restored to a right relationship with God. But the invitation comes that we, we must put our faith in Jesus. But, but also, as we think of the invitation to come, drink, eat, and be satisfied, we, we, we must think about Jesus, what Jesus himself reveals to us in the New Testament. Uh, what, what does Jesus really offer? Uh, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 4. I would like to read verses 6 through 14 of John chapter 4. This is the account of Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman. Um, I'll pick up uh, with verse 6 where we read this. Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. Uh, that, that is the well in Samaria. And it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink for me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God... And who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Verse 11, the woman said to him, Sir, you, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where, where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give to him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So Jesus isn't offering mere H2O. He, he's offering something far more than that. But he does it in a very effective way because we know that without physical water, we cannot physically live. We'll die. We, we must stay hydrated in order to live physically. And so what Jesus is really saying is this, you, you can't have real life without what I'm offering. What I offer will give you eternal life. If you drink of the water that I offer, you will never die. You will never thirst. You will always be satisfied. So what is eternal life? It, it's not just an infinitely long life. It, it's a life restored to God through faith in Jesus Christ. The restoration this restoration to God really is a grand conversion. It's a radical change that takes place in the heart of a sinner. It requires being born again by the Spirit, as John 3 teaches us. It includes our confession of sin. It includes our repentance. It includes believing that Jesus is the Son of God who came to this earth to die on the cross in my place. It includes believing that Jesus suffered in my place. It includes believing that Jesus took my sin upon himself on that cross and was buried and was raised to life. And that by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, I'm forgiven of my sin 
and counted as righteous before God. Jesus took my sin and gave me a gift of his righteousness. And because of this, I'm restored to a right relationship with God. I'm known by God, and I know God only through Jesus and the water that he offers for me to drink. You will, you will never, ever be disappointed when you truly know God. And we can only know God through Jesus. This is the eternal life that Jesus offers. Come, come, come to Jesus. Drink, eat, and be satisfied. The, the satisfaction that Jesus offered is far more than satisfying of physical thirst. The thirst Jesus satisfies is that deep longing peace with God. Until we are restored to a right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, we will be restless in our souls. We will never rest until we rest in Christ. The, the guilt of our sin will press heavy upon our hearts and our souls. We, we can't escape it. Nothing, nothing we do can take it away. We, we will live in fear of judgment and death until we drink and eat what Jesus has to offer, then we will thirst no more. So this text says, come and drink and eat of Jesus and, and be satisfied. But also the Lord says, listen to me that your soul may live. Through Jesus, who fulfills God's promise to David, he says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Um, verse 3 of Isaiah 55 says, Incline your ear and come to me, hear that your soul may live, and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. So, da David, King David, was given a very bold promise that his, one of his descendants would reign on his throne as a righteous king forever, forever. And today we know that king is Jesus. And so it's really through Jesus that an everlasting covenant was established. Now, the book of Hebrews demonstrates that the old covenant given on Mount Sinai did in fact serve a very good purpose. But Jesus came to establish the new covenant and as Hebrews 8.13 says, in speaking of a new covenant, I quote, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So God puts the old covenant in place until Jesus was revealed. But what we have in Jesus now is far better um, than what we had in the old. And that, that something better, that far better is... a is a very important theme that we see throughout Hebrews. Um, as an example, the sacrifices stipulated uh, in the Old Covenant didn't take away sin. Hebrews tells us that. They, in fact, reminded us of sin. They were a constant testimony of our sin. And they kept pointing forward to when Jesus would come and be the spotless Lamb of God who would give his life on the cross, shed his blood once and for all to take away our sin. But for our purposes here today, what verse 3 wants you to see is that through Jesus, an everlasting covenant will be established. Uh, it, it gives an eternal redemption. This new covenant that is established with the shed blood of Jesus gives us life, eternal life. And, and so there is this call for us to listen, listen to Jesus. 
Also in verses 4 and 5, we read this, Behold, I make him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. So this text begins by saying, Behold, and we've seen that before. When we see that in the text, it's like, okay, sit, sit up, pay attention, don't, don't miss this. Um, don't, don't miss what is being communicated, that Jesus will in fact come from Israel, but he will be for the peoples. He'll be for the nations, for all peoples, all people groups. Jesus' ministry would be for all people, Jew and Gentile. There, there is no other person that we need for whom we should look for. So we're, we're told to look to Jesus. And this is why in verses 6 and 7, the Spirit says through Isaiah, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Repent and experience the compassion and pardon of our God. Let me read verse 6 and 7. Um, verse 6. Seek the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. <laughs> it's a beautiful invitation that's given. We, we see three things here, and we're going to close, we're going to sing a song, and we're going to prepare for the Lord's table together, but there are three things that we, we need to see. As we think about this, this idea that Jesus alone satisfies our thirst, that Jesus alone gives life to our being, it, it only makes sense that the first thing that we see here is that we should seek the Lord while he may be found. Something needs to take place in our heart of hearts where, as we sang early, we turn our, our eyes to Jesus. We look to Jesus. We seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Don't, don't wait. Look to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. Call upon Jesus. Uh, Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon Jesus today. Um, don't wait. I, if you're waiting, I, I would ask why. What, what's keeping you from looking to Jesus, calling upon him? And secondly, it, it says here, the wicked must forsake their way. In other words, this is a call for us to repent, to leave your life of sin, to leave your own sinful ways and your own sinful thoughts, to turn from your sin and turn to the Lord. That's, that's the call for us to recognize that God alone is holy and what He teaches through His commands and through the teachings of Christ expose where we fall short, far short. We all fall short of God's glory. And when we think about the holiness, the righteousness of God, and we think about our own sinfulness and what we deserve, and we seek the Lord, we, we turn to the Lord, we, we leave our sin, we, we confess our sin, we turn from our sin, and we run to Jesus, who alone is righteous. No, notice, though, what, what happens, the third thing. When you seek the Lord and repent of your sin, the Lord will have compassion on you, and you will be abundantly pardoned. Now, there, there are a number of places in Isaiah where the message against the Israelites um, was pretty stern. It was... It was heavy. It was filled with judgment. 
And rightly so, because there was a stubbornness in their hearts that though they had heard of and seen the hand of God at work, they refused to leave their sin. And so a stern message of judgment was fitting and appropriate. But, but here the invitation is so warm. It, it is so grace-filled. It is a gracious invitation to, to seek the Lord, to turn to the Lord, to repent, turn away from wickedness and turn to the Lord. And when we do that in faith, we, we will experience the compassion of the Lord and abundant pardon. <laughs> Folks, there's, there's nothing greater than being weighed down with the guilt of our sin and then seeing the, the person and the work of Jesus and what he did on that cross, how he suffered in our place, and how through repentance and faith, our sin can be forgiven. It's gone. I remember one time talking to a, a, a person that I knew well who had committed adultery. And my first conversation with him early, early in the week, he was in despair, and he was ready to take his life. And he met with a pastor that ministered the gospel to him. He responded with repentance and faith. And when I talked to him at the end of the week, he said, I can't explain it. I was ready to take my life, and today I have great joy in my heart. <laughs> what made the difference? He sought the Lord. He turned from his wickedness. He experienced the compassion of the Lord and he was abundantly pardoned. That, that's the work that Jesus does. So I say to you this morning, come, drink, eat, and you will be satisfied. Let's pray together. Father, what an amazing text. What a powerful invitation. What a great God that you are. What a rich, rich, satisfying plan of salvation that you have given. Thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for Jesus who came. Lived a perfect life always conforming to your will and even for the joy that was before him endured the shame of the cross and willingly laid down his life to be obedient to you so that he could purchase the salvation for all those that you came to save father i want to pray for each and every individual here this morning i'm thankful that you know the hearts of each one. You know those who are young and those who are old and everyone in between. And you know where their heart is before you. And I, I pray this morning that if there are any here that have yet to just hum, humble themselves before you and to seek you and to turn from their stubborn unbelief and their own love of living life their own way i pray that they would repent even this day and come to you and find in jesus what he offers they find compassion and abundant pardon but father I, I pray for those of us this morning that have already been the recipients of your grace in this way where we, where we um, have been made alive by your spirit. We have turned from our sin. We have turned to Jesus and we drank the cup and ate the bread that 
only He offers, and we have experienced the satisfaction that only He can give. Father, help us to be a people that every day not, not turn away from, not lose sight of, not grow distracted or bored with, but we would every day live in light of this precious, precious gift of eternal life that Jesus has given something that only Jesus can give, that we can't work for. No amount of money can purchase. It's a gift that only Jesus can give. And it's a gift that only, it's only this gift that will truly satisfy. So help us, Father, to have hearts that remain uh, focused upon Jesus, satisfied with Jesus, and in Him alone. So we pray that. Uh, for each of us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing um, a song together as we prepare for um, the Lord's table together. I'm going to ask the men if they would come forward and pre be ready for that. We're going to sing a song entitled "This Wonderful, The Wonderful Cross. And uh, so let's uh, affor uh, affirm the, 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 the beauty, the wonder of this cross of Christ and um, then we'll partake of the Lord's table together.
I want to preach again. But I'm not going to too much. But in John chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000 people, plus women and children, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And when they were all done, there were 12 baskets of bread left over. (laughs) There was plenty. God showed the glory of his glory through the work of Christ. The disciples left. They were on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. They got in a boat. The disciples got in a boat. They went to the southwest part of the Sea of Galilee, and the crowd noticed that Jesus didn't get in the boat. But the next day, they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, and he had not walked around with them to the other side of the lake. And they said, how how'd you get here? And they didn't know this, but Jesus walked on the water and went out to his disciples and helped them finish that, that trek across the Sea of Galilee. And in light of that, we come to verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when, when did, where did you come from? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, You are seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Son has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, This is the work of of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, It was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, but I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Are you looking to the Son today? Are you trusting in the Son alone today for your salvation? If you are, I invite you to partake of the Lord's table with us this morning. The bread represents the body of Christ given for us. He suffered in our place. The cup represents the blood of Jesus that establishes a new covenant where there is real forgiveness of sin. And so when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we affirm, we remember the, the work that, G, that God did through Jesus so that all who believe have eternal life. And as we do this, we in a very real way have the privilege through the person and work of Jesus to commune with God. It's an awesome thing. We celebrate communion and we're going to partake of symbols, but they speak of a reality that we have in Christ that is real. 
and we want to enjoy him today. If you're here this morning and you've not yet uh, turned to Jesus and repented of your sin and put your faith in Jesus for your, your abundant pardon, we, we urge you to do that even today. But we also urge you to just pass the bread and the cup by um, until you come to that place where you are willing to repent and put your faith in Jesus alone. If you're here this morning and you're a believer and we partake of this, um, we're, we're, we're remembering God is holy. We've fallen far, far short. We're sinners. But what Jesus did was enough. It was sufficient for us to have the forgiveness of sin. Our, our hope comes through Jesus. Um, we have the gift of eternal life through Jesus. And we want to remember him well together this morning. As is has been our practice since the pandemic. Um, I, after I'll pray, I'll ask the elders to come, and then we'll let from the first row and then back those of you who are prepared to partake of communion come forward, receive the cup and the bread, and then return to your seat. And when everyone is together, I'll lead us in partaking of the uh, the symbols together. Um, if you're here and it's more difficult for you to walk to the front and would prefer to sit, uh, Tim uh, will uh, serve you. Just uh, raise your hand, let him know that uh, he, you would like him to bring the elements to, to you. So let's, let's pray together. Father, what a joy it is to come to Jesus, to drink and eat and be satisfied that in Jesus there is compassion there is abundant pardon Father thank you that in your mercy and grace you've called us to yourself you've made our hearts willing to leave our sin and our unbelief and to turn to Jesus and put our faith in him and today we affirm this great work that you have done in providing eternal life for all who believe. And we look to you now with thankful hearts as we partake of the bread that represents the body of Christ given for us and the cup that represents this new covenant established with the precious blood of Jesus. We thank you. In his precious name we pray. Amen. Corinthians 11, Paul says this, 
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, it is with thankful hearts that we eat this bread and drink this cup. It is with thankful hearts that we remember well that through Jesus, suffering in our place, we have the forgiveness of sin. Our guilt is gone. There is Therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we have peace with you. Father, what an amazing gift. We thank you and we praise you for it. Through Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together and sing a song. Thank you, Jesus. of the cross I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary you the perfect holy one crushed your son who drank the bitter cup reserved for me your blood has washed away
before we're dismissed. There will be a baptism and membership class on September 26th. Beginning September 26th will run for six weeks. If you're interested in either one, baptism or membership, uh, please see pastor. Uh, also, the children's work, uh, workers meeting. It's a, um, a mandatory meeting for everyone that works in the nursery or deals with, uh, works with children and uh, notice that it's a review and affirmation. So uh, there's maybe some things that we need to improve on or change, and so that will be the purpose of that meeting. And then finally, Kids Club will begin on uh, Wednesday, September 15th at 6.30 p.m. And we invite all kids, for, uh, K-4 to sixth grade, to join in Kids Club, and that will bring your parents here as well. So let us pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are thankful once again for this time that we had to worship. We thank you for the message that we heard today. What an encouragement, Lord. We, we are distracted by so many things that would bring us temporary pleasure but never satisfy. But it is only you and your grace and your mercy that satisfies completely. And I pray, Lord, that you would refocus our hearts and our minds and our eyes on you, the only one that completely satisfies. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.